So anyway, we're, we're glad that you're here. And uh, I'm going to have you open your Bibles this morning to the book of James. The book of James. We finished, we finished uh, looking at Hebrews last Sunday. So today we are officially going to start, begin the study of the book of James. Which, in, it's, 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 obviously it's a natural next book to look at after you study the book of Hebrews. And my, the title to the message this morning is James, the most misapplied book in the New Testament. James, the most misapplied book in the New Testament. So that's, uh, that's where, what we're going to begin uh, today. And today we're pretty much going to be just some introductory book uh, notes about the book itself. And we would encourage you to, over the next several weeks, just, just read it with us as, as you come each week to study. And I trust that you'll, um, you'll get a lot, a lot more out of the book as, as you do. So, okay. so let's, let's then begin our hearts, uh, open our hearts together in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time and our provide understanding. Our gracious God and Father, we're thankful that we could spend some time this morning looking into your word. Father, we're grateful for what this new year holds out to us, whether it is the shout and our call home to glory, or whether it is each and every day just another continuation of the dispensation of your grace to us Gentiles, and therefore an opportunity for us as ambassadors to live lives that represent to this lost world what it looks like to be a citizen of heaven. And we pray for insight and wisdom now as we get, begin this new study here on the book of James, that we would be edified and strengthened by it and encouraged by it, not only for our own personal growth and our own personal understanding, but also so, so that we might be vessels unto honor, able to be used by you in dealing with others who might be struggling with some information about how to deal with this little book here. And we'll thank you for this book, and we thank you for our study. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, um, so you should at this point have your Bibles opened up to the book of James, and today is pretty much going to be introductory, and I want to give you just some kind of opening comments about the book of James. And is there any doubt that James is, in much of Christianity, quite a controversial book. Any doubt about that? What's that? For sure. It's interesting that uh, Martin Luther is um, famous for having said about the book of James, because he didn't really know what to do with the book of James, but he's famously said about the book of James that it's a right strawy epistle, and that he was willing to light his fire with it, okay? <laughs> now, now, you don't want to do that with the book of James, okay? That, that's not, that, that's not, you don't want to do it with any book of the Bible. It's just that he didn't understand what to do with the book of James. And it's interesting that the vast majority of professing Christians while they don't come to the same conclusion as he did, that is that you light your fire with it, they do still have the same problem that he had with it, and that is they don't know what to do with the book of James other than they want to apply it to themselves. Now, the absolute, well, let, let me ask it this way. What is it in the book of James that is the source? What are the passages, what are the verses in the book of James that's the source of most of the confusion about the book of James. Yeah, James chapter number two. Exactly. Everybody turn with me, if you would, to James chapter number two, and you're also going to want to get the book of Romans chapter three. Look over to uh, James chapter number two, and then Romans in chapter number three. So I want you to have James chapter number 2, and we're going to start at verse 14, James chapter 2, verse 14, and notice, he says here, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works, can faith save him? Do you understand the question there? 
Now, what's implied in the question by, by James? What, what's implied in the question? Yes, yeah, faith and works to be saved is, is clearly implied in the question, right? If you'll look a little, we're not going to read all every single verse down through here, but if you'll look at verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Look at verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And then verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Okay, is it, do, you, do you at least see that James does make it clear that in, in his view that to say that you're justified by grace through faith alone without works, you see how James is not saying that same thing. Does everyone see that first? Everybody got that? If, if you'll hold that passage there, go over to Romans. Go over to Romans chapter 3 this time. Go over to Romans chapter number 3. Look over to Romans 3. I'm going to start at verse 21. And it says this, But now the righteousness of God without the law. And that phrase when it says without the law, what, what therefore would that include? What would that imply? I mean, that would be without works. Everybody got that? He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them. And then what does it say there? Then that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified... What, is the, what does the word justified mean? To be declared right. Okay. So that verse says being justified freely. Yeah, that's a grace word, isn't it? Yeah. He says to being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So does it sound like the Apostle Paul believes and teaches that someone who is lost and condemned is actually justified in the eyes of God freely. I mean, that's what he says, by grace alone. Is that what it says there? If you'll look ahead to verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, you, you can read, I can read, people can read. And is Paul and is James, are they saying the same thing with regard to how someone is saved? Yeah, say no, because they're not saying the same thing. All right? So what, so what do you do with something like that? Because after all, I thought there were supposed to be no contradictions in the Bible. And it's because of passages like these, when you look at what the Apostle Paul teaches about being right with God, and then what James teaches about faith plus works and so forth, is because of passages like these that people in Christianity become very, very confused, and they don't quite know what to do with it, but they do something with it. What they tend to do is, well, James is simply talking about your righteousness before men. Have you ever heard that? That James is speaking about, well, not, not righteousness before God. He's simply talking about righteousness before men. Well, it sure seemed to me in the context in James 2, when I read, he's talking about in the, present, in the sight of God. And even the Lord Jesus Christ said, do not your righteousness before men. That's what the Lord said. So to say that, well... To say that, well, James and Paul are fundamentally saying the same thing. All right. Okay. But I don't think that at all. <laughs> I can read and so can you. So you don't have to buy into the concept, the theological viewpoint that, well, they're, they're, all, they're all writers in the New Testament, and so they're fundamentally all the same thing. 
Well, no, they're not. Don't be afraid to disagree with the theologians, okay? <laughs> you can read, I can read. But because of that great difference between what the Apostle Paul says and what James says about justification alone or justification plus faith plus works, and that's what creates the confusion. And, and James becomes, has become in Christianity one of the prominent books in Christianity for how a Christian should learn to live the life of a believer. Okay? Now, is there any problem with that? And the answer is yes. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, if, if you and I want to understand, first of all, how the life of a believer actually functions, where do you go to in your Bible to find that information? You got to go to the writing of the Apostle Paul, the writings of the Apostle Paul, and in particular, someone said Romans. Patty, you said Romans, right? You got to go to Romans. Romans is where you find out how life in Christ functions, how it actually works, and therefore how it can and should work in my life. To go to the book of James as the pattern for how the life of Christ in the believer is to work and what it's to look like is to go to the wrong place. And fundamentally what, it, what the issue is, is that people don't, they don't want to rightly divide the word of truth. They don't want to recognize that while James says what he says and he means what he says, he's just saying it to a different audience than the Apostle Paul is speaking to. But if, if, you, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, if you don't recognize that where we live historically in the dispensation of grace, if you don't recognize who James is writing to, and you just blend everything together, well, then it's no wonder there's such confusion out there. And so if, if you sit under the ministry of someone who teaches that you are, to, you are to live your life as a Christian out of the information in the book of James, well, then... What happens when you actually try to apply the book of James in your life? What, what does it lead to? How about, yeah, someone said Romans 7. Yeah. How long do you want to stay in Romans 7? Get out of Romans 7 as soon as you can, okay, in your experience, all right? But I, I don't at all doubt the sincerity and the genuineness of the preachers and the pastors that are doing this. And I can pick on pastors because I am a preacher. I am a pastor, okay? So I'm not, I'm not taking shots at someone that isn't you know, worthy of it. They're in the pulpits themselves and are accountable, as am I. So I don't doubt their sincerity and their desire and their intention at all. That's not what's in question here. The question is, who does James say that he thinks he's writing to and about? That's what he says. Look over to James chapter number one there. James chapter number one. Look at James chapter number one. Look at James chapter number one, and he says this, verse, the very first verse. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So who does James believe that he's writing to? So which tribe are you a part of? No, you're not a part of any of the tribes. In the Bible, every single time in the Bible, 100% of the time when you see the phrase 12 tribes, it is always a reference to those who were the physical descendants of Abraham, to who? Isaac. To who? Jacob. Remember that? Jacob is the one whose name is changed to Israel, by the way. Okay. And he's the one that had the 12 sons. So, is that 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12? Okay. So, the 12 tribes are those, that, that nation that came from Israel. In Scripture, every time that you see the phrase, the 12 tribes 
It's always a reference to those who were the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of which James himself was a part. So when he says he's writing to the 12 tribes, who does he think he's writing to? Okay. So who does the Holy Spirit believe the book of James is written to? To Israel. Not, not, not to you and me as members of the body of Christ. Not written to Gentiles. Okay, that's real important. Remember that. Go ahead. That's an excellent observation. What Laurie said was, uh, to further clarify this, is that it's not written even to Jews during the dispensation of grace. Okay, we'll get back to that in a few minutes. Okay, in the introduction. Okay. So recognize that the book is controversial, but it doesn't need to be. It absolutely can be understood like any of the other books in the Bible, if you leave them in their setting, in their context, to who it's written, what it's written about, and so forth. So that's what's really significant to begin in our study of this particular book. Okay? So, something else to keep in mind. That, it, that look at, if you're back in chapter 1, verse 1, right? You notice it says James... There's a lot of debate about who the James is. A lot of discussion about who the James is. And in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in the book of Acts, there really are only three Jameses that it's a possibility of. Okay? Let me point these out to you just real quickly here. Look over to Matthew 10. Go over to Matthew chapter 10. Go over to Matthew chapter 10. Watch this. In Matthew 10, this is where Matthew records when the Lord Jesus Christ, from the group of the disciples that were following him, he picks out 12 who he appoints as apostles. This is Matthew 10, right? It says at verse 2, Matthew 10, 2. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first is uh, Simon, who we call Peter, Andrew, his brother. And then, who's the next one there? Notice you've got James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Remember the, what the other name for the two of them was? Boanerges. Boanerges, which meant sounds of thunder. Okay, they're, they're, they're the word of God. Represent the word of God, Boanerges. It's an interesting word. Anyway, so you've got James, the son of Zebedee. Now, ver look at verse 3. Then you have Philip, you've got Bartholomew, you've got Thomas, then Matthew, the publicans, and then you've got a second James, James, the son of Alphaeus. So among the 12 apostles, there were two who were named James. Okay? If you go to Matthew 13, if you go to Matthew 13, go to Matthew chapter 13. Look at Matthew 13, and if you will look at verse 54. Matthew 13, 54, it says this. And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom in these mighty works? Now watch what they observe, watch what they say. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Okay, so far, yes or no? Okay. And his brethren. Now, the word brethren there, that, not, they're not talking about his disciples. They're talking about his family members, right? And notice they name them, James and Joseph, Simon and Judas, and then it says, and his sisters. So he had at least two sisters, half-sisters. Everybody got that there? Okay. So there's a third James right there in that verse. James, you'd, you'd say the brother of the Lord, but, but technically you'd say the half-brother of the Lord. Everybody see the verse there, verse 55? So the half-brother of the Lord. All right? So when you read the gospel accounts, there are three possibilities of who the James was. Most have come to the conclusion that it is James, the half-brother of the Lord. Most have come to that conclusion. And that may or may not be so. Um, one of the reasons that they have come to that conclusion is that the writer himself doesn't identify himself as an apostle per se. He doesn't say James, an apostle of the Lord. 
Well, that in and of itself is not a conclusive argument. You understand that? An argument from silence, while it can carry lots of weight, in and of itself is not, does not stand alone necessarily. Does the Apostle Paul in any of his writings ever begin any of his epistles or books by just claiming he's a servant? The answer is yes. Interesting. And yet, was he an apostle? Interesting, okay. So just the fact that he doesn't say that he was an apostle, that in and of itself doesn't mean that he was not one of the 12, all right? If you look over with me to the book of Acts in chapter number 12 here, over to Acts 12. Look over to Acts chapter number 12. Acts 12 verse 1. Very interesting chapter in the book of Acts. It says at 12 1, it says, And about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And you realize that, that church would be the Jewish church. Messianic church. That's not the church, the body of Christ, okay? It says, and he killed James, the brother of John. So the 12 apostles now are down to 11. Remember, there already had been a replacement for Judas, and who was that replacement? It was Matthias, remember that? So James, who's the brother of John, he's one of the, one of the, the, pair, one of the two brothers who were the sons of thunder, the voice of God, as it were, Boanerges, Herod kills him right here. And because at this point, James, who was one of the apostles, is dead, it has led many uh, to conclude that therefore the book of James could not have been written by this James or by the other James who was an apostle. And therefore it must have been written by James a half brother of the Lord. But that assumes something else. That assumes that the book of James must therefore have been written after Acts 12. Understand why I said that? Okay. It was written after the death of this James, so they eliminate this James. But when you read the book of James itself, the book of James is writ it's not written late. The book of James is written very, very early. In fact, most, most who, who teach about this book, it, 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 the theologians and so forth, they all have, they, I shouldn't say all, but most of them have come to the conclusion that at least of the Hebrew epistles, the book of James was the earliest one ever written. So, but they want to put it after Acts 12. Well, there's nothing in the book of James to tell you it was written after Acts 12, and there's plenty in the book of James to suggest it was written way before Acts 12. Okay? So therefore, who is the, who is the human author? I ask a different question. Does it really matter? Interesting. What, what's more important in discerning which of the three James it was is discerning what he says and to whom he says it, okay? That's what's way more important, all right? So you yourself can struggle with the issue of who the author of the book of James is. I, James, I have my own conviction and so forth. It's definitely one of those three. But in the end, it's more important to really appreciate what the author says and to whom he says it to, okay? So that being the case, then go back with me over to James in chapter number one there. James chapter number one. Let's see here, and I'm just hunting for another verse for here. Yeah, look over to uh, Acts 26 as well. Get, get James 1 and get Acts 26. Now, James, in, in verse 1, he says he's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, right? Now, how would you know for sure who he thinks the 12 tribes were? How would you know that? What's, what's that? 
How would you know for sure, when he says he's writing to the 12 tribes, how would you know for sure who he thinks he's writing to? Yeah, he says to the 12 tribes, but how would you know for sure who, that, who he thinks they are? What's that? Okay, one is the idea of the use of the word scattered. Okay, they're under the, the fifth course of chastisement, which we will talk about that extensively. We may not get to it this morning, but... But, but how would you know who the 12 tribes are? And I don't mean, I don't mean know them, say, by, by name, per se. I'm saying, how do I know he's talking about Israel and not the Gentiles? How do you know that? Well, he's a Jew himself. One, he's a Jew himself. Well, how else? Tribes, that, that's true. He's one of the 12 tribes. How else? Yeah, what you want to do is just, just take your Bible and look at every time in the Scripture where you see the 12 tribes come up and see, okay, contextually, who is it a reference to? Remember that? And if the phrase, the 12 tribes, is consistently and repeatedly a reference to, as we mentioned this a minute ago, a few minutes ago, if it's repeatedly and consistently a reference to the, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then what would faith, what would you believe, what should you believe about who he thinks he's writing to? Should you, should you believe, well, even though he says he's writing to the 12 tribes, he's really writing to Gentiles? Would that make any logical sense at all? That would not be a walk of faith. That would be unbelief. That would be superimposing our own bias, our theological or religious bias on the verse. And that's wrong. You, you, you cannot imagine, actually maybe you can because you've been around this message, but, but the pushback against this simple concept that we get when we say, well, James, he's writing to the 12 tribes, so he's writing to Israel. The pushback, well, I know he says that, but, no, there is no but about it. But the pushback against this is, is amazing. How people will come up, well, yeah, but what about? Well, yeah, but what about what? If you wrote a letter to your mom or your dad or your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter or your best friend or whatever, if you wrote someone and you put their name on that letter, then who did you write the letter to? If someone else gets that letter and they read it and they say, oh, I know you wrote it to your wife or your husband, but you really meant it for me. That would be dishonest. That would not be a walk of faith, right? That would not be, you know, well, whatever. Go ahead. It wouldn't be inspired by God. Either. That's correct. It wouldn't be inspired by God. That's right. It's an allegorical. It's, it's, it's well, it says that, but it doesn't mean it. It's really, it's really to be applied for all of us. Okay? When James says he's writing to the 12 tribes, there's an interesting passage that, at least in my mind, helps to shed light on this when sitting down and talking with someone about this, and they're, they're maybe upset with you or this or that, but they're willing to sit down and look at the scripture, okay? Look over with me to Acts 26 here. Look over to Acts 26. Look over to Acts 26. The Apostle Paul here is speaking and he conveys about like his past before he became a believer, etc., things like that. Look at verse 1, Acts 26, 1. It says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth a hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things where... I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and judge for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Now watch the next verse. Unto which promise our 12 tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, and so on. Question, in that verse, when Paul says 12 tribes, who does Paul think he's talking about? Who did he believe that Agrippa 
would have believed that Paul meant by the phrase 12 tribes when Agrippa was when he was making his defense before Agrippa. Yeah. Why would Paul believe that when Paul used the phrase 12 tribes in the presence of Agrippa, that he, without question, figured Agrippa would know what Paul meant by it? What, say, say, again, say it loud. Yeah, he, right here in the verse, Paul begins his defense by being grateful to Agrippa that, that, that Agrippa was familiar with all the customs of the Jews. You understand that concept there? So if someone says, well, James, who James is written before Acts 26 here. If the Apostle Paul, preaching to a Gentile, who knew about Israel's history and their customs and so forth, and he uses the phrase 12 tribes, then if James used the same phrase but meant something different, then shouldn't James have told us that he meant something different? What, shouldn't the Holy Spirit have done that? Is that a concept there? The fact that the Apostle Paul here in Acts 26, who this is after James has already written the book of James, still uses that phrase there, 12 tribes, that is more than conclusive evidence. That when James says he's writing to the 12 tribes, he really means he's writing to Israel. He's not writing to you and me as Gentiles, and he's not writing to the church, the body of Christ, in the dispensation of grace. Now, even if you're not settled on that concept, that's okay, because Scripture says that every man be persuaded in their own mind, right? Let me just suggest that for, for, for just go and just read the book of James. Not from the standpoint of thinking that it applies to you, but just say, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to entertain this crazy notion that James really is written exclusively to the 12 tribes. I'm just going to entertain that for a second. I don't agree with it. I don't believe it. But I'm just going to entertain that idea. So for a second, I'm going to put off the idea that I think it's written to me and about me. Instead, I'm going to read it as though it was written to the Jews about the Jews' program about the tribulation period. I'm just going to read it that way. And read it 10, 12, 50 times. See what you might come to. <laughs> might be an interesting study, wouldn't you say? I think you'll find that to be so. Something else about, uh, about not just who it was written to. It's clear who it was written to, not the body of Christ, but to the 12 tribes. But what's the setting of the book? And therefore, when was it written? What's the setting and when was it written? Watch this now. Look over to chapter 5 of James. Look over to chapter 5 of James. You've got to remember that this was a real document written by a real person sent out to the real 12 tribes of Israel. And they were scattered abroad. So, they mu so if, by the way, Something, a whole different thing to think about is the doctrine of preservation. J James wrote, wrote one letter, the book of James, one document, right? The, the, the actual document itself. But it was written to the 12 tribes. They weren't all sitting in his living room. He didn't have internet. He couldn't email this to everyone. He couldn't text message to everyone, Right? They were scattered abroad all over the place. What therefore must have been true with regard to this document, it had to have been reproduced. It had to have been copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and gotten out to all the, all the Jews scattered all over the place in order for the 12 tribes who were scattered abroad to read what he said. So the book itself demands the continuation of the process of preservation. What benefit would it have been if there was only the one letter itself, one total? It would have taken a little bit of time for that, everyone to get that one letter, right? <laughs> and by the way, that concept is true of all these documents, all these books that became scripture and so forth. They all had to be copied to get spread abroad everywhere. So it's a wonderful 
truth about the doctrine of pres not just inspiration, but preservation. All right? So at any rate, so this, it was, this book was copied. It was spread out all over the place. Those Jews, when they would be reading this book itself, historically, actually reading it, look at chapter 5. Look at chapter 5, verse 7. Chapter 5, verse 7, he says this. Be patient, therefore, brethren. What's the next phrase there? Unto the coming of the Lord. Now, that statement in and of itself and by itself, in other words, if you just took that verse out of context and everything, that may or may not tell you the setting. But when you read it in the context, jump down to verse 8. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord. What? Well, now you've got a context when he says, unto the coming of the Lord. He's saying it's drawing nigh. At the time that James wrote the book of James, you've you got to remember this way, that, let me say, it, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to dove two, dovetail two things together. The time of the writing and the setting of the writing. The coming of the Lord drew nigh. When you read the book of James, is there anything in the book of James any reference, any concept, any mention at all about this other guy named the Apostle Paul? Is there any information in the book of James to suggest that the nation of Israel had fallen? Any information in the book of James about the gospel of the grace of God? Any information in the book of James about the middle wall of partition, that division between Jew and Gentile, that it had been gone, it's out of the way? Any information at all in the book of James that you would find in Paul's epistles about the one new man, the church, the body of Christ, the new creature, heavenly places. There's none of that in the book of James at all. There's no hint about it at all. Doesn't that therefore also suggest, indeed demand, that James is written way before any of Paul's ministry and message was, was spread abroad. You understand why I say that? And I understand again, I understand that is an argument from absence. And so an argument from absence does not stand alone, but sometimes the argument from absence is very loud in what it says. After all, think about 2 Peter. In 2 Peter, is Peter aware of Paul's ministry? What chapter in 2 Peter? Chapter 3. And Peter's not only aware of Paul's ministry, Peter is aware of Paul's written ministry. And not only is Peter, in fact, look at, look at that verse. Look over to 2 Peter 3. Look over to 2 Peter 3. Watch this now. This is real interesting as well. 2 Peter 3.15 2 Peter 3.15, it says, 2 Peter 3.15 says this, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord, the long-suffering in that verse is a reference to the, the, the delay, the reason Christ hadn't returned yet at, at the time Peter write, writes this book, okay? But he says, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom get, given unto him, hath written unto you. So see how he's not only aware of Paul's ministry, he's aware of Paul's written ministry. <laughs> And he says in verse 16, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Something else that Peter is aware of is that in Paul's epistles, Paul's talking about some things that are, as he says, what? Hard to be understood. Why, why, why would it, if Peter not only had spent three years with the Lord Jesus Christ, plus the 40 days after his death and resurrection, plus the Lord Jesus Christ breathed on Peter, as well as the other apostles, and gave him the Holy Spirit, plus the Pentecost, they had another filling with the Holy Spirit and so forth. They had their eyes open to understand the scriptures. How come Peter, when he read Paul's epistles, would find some things in Paul's epistles hard to be understood? Because it was different information. It was new information. But another question, 
Not only is Peter aware of Paul's written ministry, was, did, was Peter clearly reading Paul's written documents? Which one of Paul's written documents were written to Peter? Not a one of them. Right? Well, then how did Peter get them? Did he go and swipe them from the church at Ephesus and so forth? <laughs> did he go, to the, did he go to, 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 to the Roman believers there? And By the way, at, remember at Rome, there were several groups of believers. So when Paul penned the book of Romans and sends Romans, who gets it first? Which group got it first? The Ro but there are several groups of Romans. They were, and they were not all one group. They were, they were diff meeting in different parts of the city. Um, you see the doctrine of preservation again here. Paul would write these documents. They'd be sent out. The local assemblies would get them and make copies and spread them abroad. And that's how Peter got some of Paul's epistles. He didn't get originals. He got copies of copies of copies of copies. The doctrine of preservation right here. Isn't that wonderful? I'm saying this. So you can see in 2 Peter, there's not only awareness of the Apostle Paul and his ministry, but the essence of his ministry as it related to Peter was that their program had been delayed, the long-suffering, and that Peter has Paul's, copies of Paul's written documents. Doesn't that therefore prove that 2 Peter had to have been written after Paul's public ministry was already begun and his written ministry had already begun. See that concept? So when you read James, there's nothing in the book of James about any awareness of any kind about this, this other apostle guy, Paul. Any, any message he was proclaiming, nothing, nothing written, nothing like that at all. So when you couple that together with the fact that in James chapter number 5, when he says here in James chapter number 5, verse 8, 5, 8, he says, Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Which coming would James have to be speaking about? He has to be speaking about the second coming. The, the chart wasn't open yet when James wrote the book of James, as it were. Does that make sense how I said that? Okay. When, when James is speaking about the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, let's say that you and I were members of the 12 tribes scattered abroad. We were the Jews, and we got this book, and we were believers. Let, let's say that we had read Hebrews, and we believed Hebrews, so we became believers and so forth. In the book of Hebrews, wasn't the setting the same? It was the last days, remember that? And the Lord, they were expecting the return of the Lord within their lifetime, within just a few, a few short years, as it were, maybe seven to ten years, right? So then you get this book, and you can see right there, he says, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Which coming would you believe he was talking about? The second coming of Christ. See that? So where would you believe that you were time-wise in that program? You would believe that you were sometime before the return of Christ, but after his ascension. So you would believe that you were some, basically you were heading into the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period. That's what you would believe, and you'd be right for believing that. So the setting of the book of James, it's clearly written early when what was in view was the coming of the Lord, as he says, draweth nigh, so it drew nigh. And if you'll look over to, uh, go back to chapter number 1, Go back to chapter number one. Watch something else he says here. Chapter one. Watch what he says. I, I'm going to jump to verse two. He says this. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I was reading 112. I think I said 2, right? Did I say 2? Okay, look, at, look over to 112. Because 212 doesn't say what I just read, right? <laughs> okay, look, look, look at 112. Look at 112. He says this. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. See the idea of blessed and enduring, and then you get 
something that the Lord promised. And that verse right there is described as the crown of life, which the Lord promised. Everybody see that there? Now go to chapter 2. Look over to chapter 2, this time verse 5. This time verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world? By the way, in the setting, who's that going to be? That's the little flock who refuse the mark of the beast so they can't buy or sell. They have to flee, remember? He says, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Did you just see the connection there? When are they going to get the crown of life? When they get the kingdom. And it's when, they, it's when the Lord returns and brings the kingdom, that's when they're going to get the crown of life because that's what the prophecy program promised them. You see, you see how the, the both verses help amplify each other? Everybody make that connection there? Okay. Not only that. When, when you read... I was, oh, man, I'm going to run out of time too fast here. <laughs> uh, yeah, really. You, you've read the book of Revelation before, right? You've read Revelation. When you read the book of... In fact, hold James there and turn over to James, uh, Revelation chapter number one. When you read the book of Revelation, do you, do you sense that, man, the coming of the Lord draws nigh? Right? At the time that John wrote the book, I mean... The, the tribulation period was just beginning, just about to get started. It hadn't started yet, but it was just about to get started, which meant the Lord would return within seven to eight years from the time John wrote that book. All right? So when you read the book of Revelation, that's why so often you see phrases like this. Look at, John, look at Revelation 1, 3. There's a phrase right at the end of the verse. He says this, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. Well, why? What does it say there? The time is at hand. When John wrote the book of Revelation, the time was at hand. What time was at hand? The time to complete the prophecy program. The tribulation period, as it were. When so often... Uh, in the book of Revelation, you'll see a phrase like this. This time, turn to the last chapter of the book, Revelation, Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter number 22. Watch this now. Revelation 22, verse 7. Revelation 22, verse 7. Behold, what? Look at verse 10. Verse 10, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book for what? The time is at hand. Verse 12, and behold, I what? I come quickly. If you look down to verse 20, he which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Well, I don't know about you, but if you told me you were going to show up at my house quickly and it was two years, 2,000 years before you ever showed up, I would not interpret that as quickly. Right? Something else. By the way, the setting of James is the same setting as John when he wrote the book of Revelation, which was the same setting of Hebrews, the last days. The setting's all the same there. Notice something else. Go to Revelation 1. Look at Revelation chapter number 1. Very, very interesting. Look at verse 3 again. What's the first statement say? Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and so forth. How often have you heard preachers about the book of Revelation or can teach the book of Revelation? They say God has promised you a special blessing if you read Hebrews. You ever heard that? Okay, so... So now we think of the book of Hebrews like it's a rabbit's foot or, or a lucky charm. What's that? Uh, 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 Revelation. Yeah, not Hebrews. Revelation, right? But this, what is the blessing promised in Revelation? The blessing is you'll make it through the tribulation period into the kingdom. That's the blessing. 
If they'll read the book of Revelation and believe what it says, the blessing, the blessing is they won't take the mark of the beast, hence they won't wind up in the lake of fire forever. They'll believe that Christ is the Messiah. They'll get into the kingdom. That's the blessing promised. Not some special, you know, God's going to make your mortgage payment next, next month if you read Revelation, kind of a thing. But make this connection as well. Notice that the book starts with that idea. Verse 3, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things. That's like the book of James. Faith plus works. Hear and do it. Look over how the book ends as well. Chapter 22. Verse 7 again. Behold, I come quickly. Watch. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You bet. If you're in the tribulation period, which you're not going to be if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for your Savior, by the way, okay? You'll be raptured out here long before that happens, right? But if you're in the tribulation period and you read the book of Revelation and you, you do what it says, you believe what it says, the blessing you're going to get is you're not going to take the mark of the beast, you're going to reject it, you're going to get into the kingdom. That's the blessing. Well, go back to James chapter 1. Make the connection here. James 1. Do you think it's just coincidence that in James 1.12, the first word is what? You see that verse? James 1.12. What's the first word? Blessed. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. That's, that's the guy who not only he believes Hebrews, he reads James, he believes James, he reads Revelation, he believes the book, and he gets into the kingdom. That's the blessed in the verse. That's the blessing there promised in the, in the passage. Isn't that something? So, well, we didn't get through all this, but uh, this is just kind of a, a brief introduction. Joseph, go ahead quickly. Yeah, that's a great question. Let's quickly go over to Acts chapter number one there. The question is this, and, and you know, I, I left way too many loose ends here, so let me just do this. Before I answer Joseph's question, let me, let me say it this way. If the book of James was written early, and like Hebrews written early and Revelation written early, and the coming of the Lord was at hand, it was at nigh, and he was going to come quickly, well, what happened? Why didn't he come? Some actually have concluded that he did come. He did return and that all revelation has all been fulfilled. That's the doctrine is preterism. Okay? But it's the view, well, it has all, all been fulfilled already. Now, now, you know, that obviously doesn't make any sense at all. But what happened and the reason that Christ didn't return is because of an eternal purpose that God had to form a new creature called the church of the body of Christ that he would use to fill the heavenly places. And he disclosed that purpose and intention. He disclosed it for the first time in human history when he saved Saul of Tarsus, represented on this chart here, as Paul the Apostle. And again, so therefore what he did, he, in, in a sense, he open the chart as it were. He reveals some hidden information. So what he, does, what he does is that he postpones it. That's, and we'll talk more about that as we get into, the, in, into James, okay? But now to Joseph's question. Go back to Acts chapter number one. Yeah, I'm going to repeat the question. So here in Acts one, so after the death and resurrection of Christ, just before his ascension, the apostles ask the Lord... The apostles asked the Lord at verse 6. One day, therefore, were come together. They asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So what's their thinking about where they were historically? They're, they're still thinking about the kingdom and its restoration, like it was in the days of Solomon, right? Were they right for thinking that? Absolutely correct, okay? So when they say, Lord, will thou at this time, what's the sense of their question? If he's already opened their understanding to understand the scriptures, which he did, 
So they're not asking this question in unbelief. They're asking it, asking for more what? More information. Well, thou at this time restore again. It's like they're asking the Lord, okay, Lord, is there anything else that you need to teach us at this point with regard to the timing in which you're going to set this thing up? You understand the sense there? His answer is this, and this was Joseph's question. Why does, why does Christ answer this way? Verse 7, it says, He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Why, why does Christ answer it that way? Does, is, is Christ being kind of evasive here? Why is he doing it this way? What's coming next? Look at what he says. What's coming next? But ye shall receive power after what? So what was coming next? Pentecost is coming next. He's already told them that he's going to depart. He's going to send another comforter. Guess what that other comforter was going to do? Go over to John chapter 14. I got, let me do this real quickly here, but, but make sure you see this, okay? Go to John 14. Look over to John 14. John 14, he's going to send that other comforter. Watch this, verse uh, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Why did Jesus Christ say it's not for you no time? He says, because he's telling them, guys, listen, I'm going to go back to the Father. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you the rest of the information. And how does he do that? The Holy Spirit gives them what became the book of Hebrews, James, Peter, Jude, and Revelation. He writes it down. Everybody's got the concept there? You see what just happened there? So he's not at all being evasive, and their question was not a question of unbelief. They're asking, okay, Lord, is there anything, anything else we need to do with regard to the timing of this thing? And in a sense, Lord, it's like, it's like he's saying, well, yes, but I'm not the one that's going to tell you about it, okay? <laughs> he says, you're going to receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, hence Pentecost, and then you'll be witnesses. You'll get the rest of the information, and you'll know it at that time. Okay, so it's a powerful, real interesting question that you asked there, Joseph. Okay, what's that? That is exactly correct. It's the rest of the prophetic schedule, as it were, the, the answer to the timing question. Yeah, the prophecy program, the prophetic program. They are, yes, and, and that phrase right there would be the all things limited to the prophecy program. Yeah. Okay, cool. Wow, we're, at, we're way over time. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time we could look into your word this morning, what we can receive, the insight, the wisdom that it gives us. And we pray that as we study these things and then as we, take a, as we have studied these things and take a, a little bit of a break right now and then for our next message, that you might be glorified and honored as we continue to enjoy fellowship around your word. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, we'll take about a five or ten.